<clears throat> okay, welcome guys to Physics 390 class 20. This class will be on the fine structure of hydrogen. And the fine structure of hydrogen are um, corrections to the energy levels of hydrogen um, having to do with uh, two effects. The uh, um, correcting for the fact that the electrons are moving pretty fast. So using a relativistic kinetic energy for the electrons, as well as um, correcting for a what's called a spin orbit interaction, which has to do with the fact that the, um, the spin magnetic moment of the electron moves in the um, an effective magnetic field generated by the uh, proton that it rotates about. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so let's delve in. This material comes from chapter 7.3 of the textbook and find out more about the fine structure of hydrogen. So corrections to the hydrogen energy levels, um, including fine structure. So this is supposed to give kind of an overview of um, the various corrections to the hydrogen energy levels, which we've learned so far. So um, recall the energies in the hydrogen atom depend only on the quantum number n, um, and this leads to an n squared de uh, fold degeneracy for each n. So for n equal one, the ground state, that would be just one state, the uh, L equals zero, M equals zero state. <clears throat> but for n equal two, that would be two squared or uh, four fold degeneracy. That would be L equal one, M equals zero. Um, and then L equal one, uh, uh, sorry, L equal um, zero, M equals zero, and then L equal one, M equals minus one, zero, or one. So there's four, um, consistent with N equal two, there's four states. Uh, and then consistent with N equal three, there would be nine states for L equal zero, L equal one, L equal two, and the, the M's associated with that. So there's a lot of degeneracy is what I'm trying to say. Um, so, <clears throat> so how does that get uh, corrected? Well, first the thing um, is that these energies are all adjusted a bit by adjusting for the finite mass of the proton. Um, and this, so basically the, the proton in treating the hydrogen atom before we treated the proton as sitting in place um, as if it had a, an infinite mass that it didn't move. But in fact, it does move and the electron and the proton rotate around a, a common center of mass, which is very near to the proton. So using the proton mass um, is a good approximation, but in fact, you need to use what's called the reduced mass of the proton and the electron, um, which is just a little bit different from the mass of the proton. Um, so that adjusts all the energies um, by just a little bit, but it doesn't change the degeneracy um, that we were talking about before. Okay, so beyond that, there are a series of corrections to the hydrogen energy levels, um, which together actually break all of the degeneracies. Um, so the first one is what we call fine structure. That's what we're concentrating on uh, mainly. And it involves two um, physically different effects, um, although they have similar size corrections, about one part in 10 to the four. Um, uh, so about one part in 10,000 um, compared to the regular energy levels of hydrogen. So the first effect is to account for, to first order for the relativistic kinetic energy of the electron. Okay, this is a formula for the uh, relativistic kinetic energy where we have <clears throat> the total relativistic energy mc squared over times gamma minus mc squared. So this is the exact formula for the relativistic kinetic energy. We just want that to first order um, just as a correction term, as a perturbation term. And we'll see how that's done in a minute. Um, <clears throat> and the reason for this is that the electrons, um, although they're not uh, at this super near the speed of light, they're going fast enough that we have to, the classical kinetic energy um, is not quite uh, accurate enough and we need to include a correction term. The second effect to account for is the so-called spin orbit effect. This is the interaction of the electron's magnetic dipole moment 
with an effective magnetic field produced by the proton. So here's a little diagram here. Here's the, uh, the proton. Here's the uh, electron. The electron has a spin to it and associated with the spin is a magnetic dipole moment. Oops. And um, so the electron rotates, uh, at least it's, it's in orbit around the uh, proton. But if we think from the point of view of the electron, the proton will be, if we freeze the electron, the proton will be rotating around the electron. So since the proton is charged, that constitutes a circulating current and that'll produce a magnetic field um, in the center. Um, a circulating current has a magnetic field in the center. So we have a magnetic moment of the uh, magnetic dipole moment of the electron in a magnet, effective magnetic field produced by the proton. And those two interact. And the term for it is spin orbit. Um, and we'll see why it's called spin orbit uh, in a minute. But really, it's a magnetic interaction between the two. Okay. <clears throat> so the, the fine structure reduces some of the degeneracy, but as we'll see uh, later in this um, video, not all of it. So there's another effect called the Lamb shift. And this is a result of uh, quantizing the electric field. So taking into account that the electric field is, um, has to be treated as uh, photons as well as uh, a field. And this actually splits uh, two levels with the same quantum number J of total angular momentum, but different amounts of orbital angular momentum. Okay, and this is a smaller effect than the fine structure effect, which is one part in 10,000. This is about one part in a million. So if we take here, um, so this is, uh, this, this notation, this two is the N value. So we have N equal two, the S here would stand for L equals zero. And then this subscript one half stands for the um, total angular momentum quantum number J. So we have um, J equals uh, one half, L equals zero. Here we have J equals one half, L equal one. And um, <clears throat> according to the fine structure interaction, the fact that the two J's are equal to each other would give the same energy for both of these. So these would still be degenerate but the lamb shift actually shifts um, according to the, uh, the L value, the S and the P shifts them just a little bit. Again, one, about one part in 10 to the minus six. Mm -hmm. So it breaks that degeneracy between the, um, the two uh, states with the same total angular momentum, uh, quantum number one half, okay? And then uh, <clears throat> the final, um, and here's a little lamb here just for fun, just uh, so bah, um, the lamb shift. Um, so the, uh, the final um, shift, which we get is called hyperfine structure. And this is a result of the interaction between the magnetic dipoles of the electron and the proton. Um, so basically if the, um, the proton has a, a weak um, um, magnetic dipole to it, if it's aligned with the magnetic dipole of the electron, that tends to be favorable. So that lowers the energy a little bit. If the proton's uh, intrinsic magnetic moment is anti-aligned with the magnetic moment of the electron, that raises the energy a little bit. But that's a small effect because the, um, the magnetic moment of the uh, proton is quite small. But that splits all energy levels into two levels in hydrogen. Um, because there's these two different states, uh, align and anti-align between the proton and the electron. This is about one part in 10 to the seven, okay? So taken together, um, the fine structure um, reduces some of the degeneracy, which we see in the, um, the hydrogen atom as we've treated it so far. And then the lamb shift and the hyperfine structure break the remaining degeneracy. So that's kind of an overview of the different effects. Um, fine structure, one part in 10 to the four, the lamb shift, one part in 10 to the six, and the hyperfine structure, one part in 10 to the seventh. Okay, <clears throat> so let's concentrate on the fine structure. Um, the first part is the relativistic kinetic energy correction. Um, remember, this is because the 
electrons are moving um, reasonably fast, not super fast. So we need the total relativistic kinetic energy expression, but we need to correct the classical expression um, a little bit. So again, the electron in the hydrogen atom has enough kinetic energy that the classical expression for the kinetic energy is an approximation. So T, which is standing here in this equation for kinetic energy, is one half mv squared, which is p squared over 2m, which in terms of an operator, um, since p is i h bar um, times the, the gradient operator, becomes minus h bar squared over 2m um, times the Laplacian. So that's the classical expression um, for the kinetic energy operator. Um, the full relativistic expression for the kinetic energy is T. The kinetic energy is the total relativistic energy E minus mc squared, the rest energy. So it's what's left over when you take the total energy and subtract off the rest energy. That's the moving energy, the kinetic energy. Now E can be written as the square root of uh, P squared C squared plus M squared C to the fourth. Um, <clears throat> again, minus MC squared. Uh, so we see that if, for example, if P, the momentum is equal to zero, um, this term drops out, we get square root of M squared C squared to the C to the fourth, which is MC squared minus MC squared. So we would just get zero for the kinetic energy. So it makes sense when the momentum is zero, the kinetic energy is zero, but this is the full expression here. This can be rewritten or factored, um, just pulling out an MC squared out of the root here and out of this um, factoring it out and we get this right here. MC squared pulled out in front times the square root of one plus P over MC squared minus one. And this is convenient because um, P over MC um, M times C would be the, um, if the mass of the momentum, if the, if the uh, classically, the classical momentum, if the object was moving at the speed of light, but we know it's not. So this is approximately equal to uh, V over C, which is gonna be, you know, uh, fairly small because V is not uh, approaching that close to C. So P over MC is, um, approximately equal to V over C, which is a small parameter, which we can expand this square root in using a Taylor series. So we write a power series or a Taylor series in the quantity P over MC. And this gives uh, this. So this is the equation back again, T equal MC squared times the square root of one plus P over MC squared minus one. And then, <clears throat> Taylor series for this is one plus uh, one plus this to the one half is one plus one half what appears here. So one plus one half P squared P over MC squared. And the next term is minus one eighth times this thing squared, which is P over MC to the fourth. And then don't forget this minus one out here. So this one out in front, the first term in the Taylor series cancels the minus one here. And we keep these two terms here. The first term, um, if you multiply it out, we get P squared over M squared C squared. So the M C squared cancels the C squared and one of the M. So we get P squared over two M, but that's just the, uh, the classical kinetic energy. So the first term in this expansion is the classical kinetic energy. The second term, if you multiply it out is minus one eighth, um, uh, minus P to the fourth over eight M cubed C squared, if you multiply this out and simplify. And that is our correction term. So that is our, we're just keeping to the first correction term to the um, relativistic. There would be more terms, but we're just keeping the first one because P over MC is relatively small. So this will so account well for the relativistic uh, motion of the electron, okay? <clears throat> so the perturbation we want is HR for relativistic, um, H prime R 
is minus p to the fourth over eight m cubed c squared. Okay, so since in the hydrogen atom, um, the degenerate end states have distinct quantum numbers L and M associated with the operators L squared and LZ, um, we can actually use non-degenerate perturbation theory for this. So even though the, um, we have degeneracy, since we have these operators which have um, these um, distinct operators which have distinct eigenvalues for the different uh, degenerate states, those, those states which are degenerate turn out to be the right states to use to find the, um, the corrections to the energies in the non-degenerate perturbation theory, okay? Um, all right, so anyway, um, so going through um, some expectation values, we take the expectation value of this perturbation in a given uh, hydrogen energy state, psi NLM, and it turns out um, there's some steps to take here. So please see the text for this. But the final co uh, correction is can be written in this form, minus En squared over two MC squared times this quantity here, four N over L plus one half minus three. So notice that this is, um, <clears throat> as compared to the um, energy of the, energies of the hydrogen atom, which are En, um, this is smaller by a factor of En over 2mc squared. En is on the order of 10 electron volts. Um, mc squared for an electron is on the order of uh, 500,000 uh, 500, electron volts. So it's 10 over 500,000 or 1 over 50,000. So it's a small effect, uh, about 1 in 10 to the fourth. Okay. So, but this is the formula here. Um, so just note without getting into being too concerned about the exact nature of the formula here, um, that it depends both on N and L, okay? So it depends, whereas the hydrogen atom uh, energies depend only on N, the correction term depends on uh, N and L. Okay, so L appears here. Okay, so that's the relativistic kinetic energy correction. And we'll come back to this. We'll bring this expression back um, to combine it with the next correction in a second or in a, in a couple minutes. Okay, so the second part of the fine structure is the spin orbit interaction. And like we said before, at, uh, in the beginning of this video, an electron has a spin magnetic moment mu. Um, in the electron zone rest frame in the H atom and the hydrogen atom, the proton appears to be orbiting it. So if we freeze the electron, the, ele the proton uh, orbits the electron and that produces an effective current loop. And so with a current loop, we always get a magnetic field at the center. So we get a magnetic field B at the electron's location. So we have a magnetic moment mu in the magnetic field B at the electron's location. And the energy of interaction here is uh, H prime. So this is our perturbation. We write SO because we're gonna show in a minute why it's called the spin orbit interaction. But it would be minus mu dot B, okay? Because if mu and the magnetic moment and the uh, magnetic field point in the same direction, we get a negative energy favoring alignment of the spin magnetic moment with the field. If they point in opposite directions, we get anti-alignment and a positive energy. And so that's not favored. So this is the energy of interaction is minus mu dot B. Okay, now we're gonna rewrite mu in terms of the spin S and we're gonna rewrite B in terms of the orbital angular momentum of the electron L. So first, we'll do the, we'll rewrite B. So it turns out the magnetic field at the location of the electron um, produced by the, the circulating proton is parallel to the electron's orbital angular momentum around the proton. Okay, so they both point in the same direction, it can be shown. And uh, with a little bit of work, if we see the text, these two can be related quantitatively by um, B is, 
one over four pi epsilon naught e over m c squared r cubed times L. So these are parallel since all these are positive and this is the coefficient that connects them. Okay, so we can, we've rewritten the, uh, the B field produced by the um, circulating proton in terms of the, um, the angular momentum of the electron around the proton. All right, what about the um, magnetic moment mu? Uh, <clears throat> and how does that connect to the spin magnetic, the spin um, angular momentum? So um, Dirac showed in his detailed theory of the electron, he showed the magnetic moment of the electron is related to its spin angular momentum by mu is equal to minus E over M times S. So it's a pretty simple formula. Um, so mu is points opposite to the direction of the spin angular momentum. So that's why the minus sign and the units work out if we have charge over mass times the angular momentum that gives magnetic moment. Okay, so we can combine these two terms. There are these two. Um, minus mu dot b would be, uh, so the minus here in front of the, the minus mu, since mu is negative, we get an overall positive. So we have e over m multiplied here, we get e squared over m squared. So we have all these constants out in front, e squared over four pi epsilon naught, one over m squared c squared r cubed, and then s dot l instead of mu dot b, because we've, writ we've rewritten s, uh, mu in terms of s and uh, b in terms of l. So in this form, we can see why it's called the spin orbit interaction, because it's, although it comes from the um, interaction as a magnetic interaction, uh, of the spin magnetic moment with the magnetic field from the proton. Um, it can be written in this form, which is convenient for, for actually finding out its value um, in terms of the spin and the orbital angular momentum. So spin orbit. So that's why it's called spin orbit because the, the perturbation when rewritten takes this form here. <clears throat> There's one more little twist, um, which is that uh, the electron's own rest frame, which we which we use to 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 find the magnetic field of the um, produced by the proton, is actually an accelerated reference frame, right? Because the electron is in circular motion around the proton, so when we, it's not an inertial frame. So you actually need an additional correction factor of one half um, to take into account the fact that the electron's rest frame is an accelerated reference frame. Um, and this is called Thomas precession. Um, so if you're interested in more details on this, you can Google Thomas precession, but it just introduces another factor of a half, which is needed. So it gives finally for the spin orbit perturbation um, just another factor of a half on what we had before. So instead of uh, e squared over four pi epsilon naught, we have e squared over eight pi epsilon naught, one over m squared c squared r cubed s dot l. Okay, so that's our final, um, that's our final uh, expression for the spin orbit interaction. So how do we evaluate that? Well, so evaluating the spin orbit interaction um, well, we'd like to find the expectation value of the perturbation, um, which I just wrote, uh, spin orbit e squared over eight pi epsilon naught, one over m squared c squared r cubed s dot l in an eigenstate. Okay, so it turns out the most efficient or most effective way to do this is to introduce the total electron angular momentum j equal l plus s. So that's the sum of the orbital angular momentum L and the spin angular momentum S of the electron. That would be the total angular momentum of the electron. And then we can, to, to um, evaluate this S dot L, we can do a nice little um, 
little bit of uh, algebra here. J squared, and remember J is L plus S. So J squared is J dot J. So L plus S dot L plus S would be using FOIL L squared plus S squared plus two times L dot S using the, uh, the inside and the uh, uh, outside. Um, so now we can solve for now s dot l and l dot s are the same thing since the dot product is what we call commutative. So s dot l, which we're looking for here, is l dot s, but we can solve this equation here for l dot s. It would just it would be j squared minus l squared minus s squared um, divided by two. So that would be one half j squared minus l squared minus s squared. So we can write s dot l is one half j squared minus l squared minus s squared. Okay. <clears throat> so the expectation value of s dot l would then be the expectation value of this one half j squared minus l squared minus s squared. And uh, that turns out to be h bar squared over two times j times j plus one minus l times l plus one minus s times s plus one. And that's true because remember that the, um, the expectation value of uh, L squared was L times L plus one H bar squared. Um, and similarly for S squared, it was S times S plus one H bar squared. And the same thing for the total angular momentum J, it's J times J plus one H bar squared. And then we have this factor of a half. So that's why we get this expression here for the expectation value of S dot L. Okay, all right, so we've got the expectation value of s dot l. We also need the expectation value of um, one over r cubed, since that's um, <clears throat> not a constant, that's a, r is a variable in the hydrogen atom. And that turns out to be given by this, um, this expression here. So it involves l and n and the Bohr radius a, okay? So that's the expectation value of one over r cubed. So combining these two where, and remember S for the electron is one half, since it's a spin one half particle, we find the uh, first order energy correction is the expectation value of our perturbation here, which would be our constants on in front, E squared over eight pi epsilon naught, one over M squared C squared, times in the numerator we have the, um, what we found for s dot l here, substituting in um, one half for s. So this becomes one half times uh, three halves or, or three quarters, so minus three quarters. And then in the denominator, we have what's the, the denominator of the expectation value of one over r cubed. Okay, so we get a pretty big expression here. Um, Fortunately, it can be simplified a little bit um, using the formula for En, um, which involves uh, n, one over n squared. So not going through the details of that, but um, you can see the text for the, the details of that. It can be simplified. Um, the spin orbit correction is En squared over mc squared times n j j plus one minus L, L plus one minus three quarters over this quantity here. Okay. So this depends, um, notice it still has this same magnitude out in front, um, En squared over MC squared that we saw for the relativistic correction. So it's still pretty small. Um, it's in fact, it's the same order of magnitude as the relative, relativistic correction, about one part in 10 to the five. And this depends on N, J and L, okay? Um, so N, the principal quantum number, J, the total angular momentum, and L, the orbital angular momentum. Okay, so we've got these expressions. Let's try to combine them now for the total fine structure correction. So just bringing these two expressions back, we had for the relativistic correction was this expression here, um, which I won't 
read out, but you can just see it here. Remember, it just depend it depends on n and l. And then for the spin orbit, it has the same coefficient out in front, e n squared over m c squared. Um, and it depends on n, j, and l. Um, so both these terms are of the same order since they have the same thing out in front and both depend on L and the second one depends on J. <clears throat> if you add these two up and do some simplifications and getting common denominators, okay, we get the total of the relativistic and the, the relativistic kinetic energy correction and the spin orbit correction, which we call together the FS or fine structure correction. So this EFS1 includes both the spin orbit and the relativistic correction. So we get the same coefficient out in front, but we can simplify this, these uh, fractions and so forth considerably um, by taking common denominators and subtracting and, and doing some uh, reductions of fractions and so forth. It turns out to be three minus four N over J plus one half, okay? So it's kind of amazing, but to notice the dependence on L, which is present in both of these has disappeared. It only depends on J, the total, uh, um, the total angular momentum of the uh, electron, not on the orbital angular momentum. So the de dependence on L disappears on combining, okay? So as we kind of looked at before, um, in looking at the lamb shift initially, um, the 2s one half state, which again, two stands for n equal two, s stands for l equals zero. The one half here stands for j equals one half, um, total angular momentum quantum number j equals one half. And two p one half, n equal two, l equal one for p and j equal one half, both have the same fine structure correction because both have n equal two and j equals one half. And the only thing that appears here is n and j. So the fine structure correction for these two is the same. And so it appears <clears throat> that these two um, energy states, two s one half and two p one half would remain degenerate. And they do um, only using the fine structure. Okay, and we can see that here in this diagram so this is, uh, let's see. So for n equal two, we're up here and L equals zero, L equals zero would be uh, this state here. So this would be L equals zero. So the S state and J equals one half would be the lower state here. So this would be the two S one half state right here. And then if we move to um, L equal one or P, that would be this state right here. And you can see that they're even. Uh, so they have the same energy with respect to the fine structure. Um, <clears throat> the J equals three half state has a higher energy, um, basically be because if we put in, instead of one half in this fine structure correction, we put in three halves, we would be subtracting off a, um, a larger number so the correction would be uh, smaller. And so we get uh, a higher value for J equals three halves energy than for J equal one half. And that's generally true. As we move up in N, we get more possible values of J, but the higher the J value, the less the correction from the, um, from the uh, unperturbed state and the um, higher the energy level. So J equals seven halves, five halves, three halves, one halves. Um, the J equals seven halves will have a higher energy than the five halves and three halves and one half and so forth. Okay, so that's kind of how this works, <clears throat> but we still have de some degeneracy because we have several levels. Um, anytime we see two even levels here, they have the same value for J, but different values for L. Um, but that's broken by the Lamb shift. Um, remember, this is a smaller effect having to do with the, um, the uh, treating the electric field as a photon. Um, and that will split these two S one half and two P one half energies. So that will split these two energies um, into two. So these will be split by just a little bit. Um, 
uh, it'll be quite small splitting, but it's it's there. And then the hyperfine structure, which we talked about before, having to do with the magnetic moments of the nucleus and the electron, uh, will split each of those two levels, the the these two split levels in two. So overall, then with all of the corrections to the straight Coulomb potential included, um, there are no true degeneracies which remain in the hydrogen atom energy levels. A lot of them are split by the fine structure, which we looked at in, in detail here. And then the remaining degeneracies after the fine structure comes in are split by the lamb shift. And then finally, with additional splitting um, by the hyperfine structure. So we get a whole, um, each of these little levels here are split uh, by the hyperfine structure. And these two levels here would be split by the lamb shift. So all these energy levels, which look to be even, are split by the smaller order effects and we get no degeneracy left, okay? Um, <clears throat> so just to summarize briefly, we've looked at the fine structure, which is a, um, a combination of two effects, um, introducing the uh, relativistic um, kinetic energy correction for the electron, and then the spin orbit, which is the, um, which is the interaction of the electrons uh, spin magnetic moment with the magnetic field produced by the, the um, effectively rotating uh, proton around it. And we see that when we combine those two, we get um, a small changes in the energy levels of the hydrogen atom, um, but still some degeneracy left. So two smaller effects, the lamb shift and the hyperfine structure um, split those energies further and we're left with no degeneracy left. Okay, so that hopefully that gives you a good idea of what the fine structure is. It's a combination of two effects of comparable, two distinct effects of comparable uh, size. And then the smaller effects, uh, smaller effects, the lamb shift and the hyperfine structure, which reduce, which split the degeneracy, which is left behind by the fine structure. Okay. All right, thanks for your attention and see you in class.